Okay, we can start. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining another computer vision talk. Uh, it's my pleasure that uh, we have Dr. Shalini de Mello today. She is a principal research scientist and research lead in the learning and perception team at NVIDIA. Uh, her primary research interests are computer vision, machine learning, human computer interaction, and learning from limited data or labels. At NVIDIA, she has developed many technologies for self-supervised and few shot learning, gaze and head pose estimation, 2D and 3D, hand gesture recognition, and many others. Uh, her research has pushed the boundaries of human computer interaction in a cars and has led to development of NVIDIA's innovative DriveX product for a smart AI based interfaces in the cars. She received her PhD and master degrees in electric car and computer engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. I personally had a chance to have Shalini as our invited speaker for FG workshop in 2019. It was very great talk. I remember uh, it was one of the talk that makes me interested to work on self-supervised learning. So I appreciate if you turn off your microphone and as you know, the presentation is interactive and you can ask questions in the middle of talk, but for now, please turn off your microphone. So today's talk is about uh, visual, uh, let me check, visual deep learning with limited labels or uh, data. So uh, welcome again, Shalini, floor is yours. You can start. Thank you so much for that introduction, Bazad. And uh, um, thank you everybody for attending. Um, so today I'm going to um, talk about um, various explorations that I have done over the past couple of years. Um, in trying to address this problem of learning from limited labels or data, uh, particularly in the context of computer vision. And so just to motivate um, why this is an important problem, um, you know, we've made a lot of progress in uh, deep learning and AI uh, over the past few years. But as Jan LeCun famously recently said that you know, the AI revolution is not going to be supervised. Um, it, it will not be supervised. So I think this is the one piece of the puzzle in AI that I, I think is personally my belief that is very important um, for us to take uh, AI and machine learning to the next level. And, um, and I, sorry, and I believe, sorry, one second. Um, and I believe this is important because um, for various reasons, First of all, it's um, you know it's it's quite hard to collect large uh, amounts of data and then annotate them, which is I think for the future of AI just not sustainable for the long term. And you know after a certain point, after you've collected data, you know you have diminishing returns in trying to in being able to improve the accuracy of your system. So this is a very highly wasteful process of our current AI practice, I think. Um, you know, and, and the need to have such large data sets um, for, for training also, I think, prevents the democratization of AI technology to where, you know, societies that are, um, you know, less wealthy or less able to develop AI technology because of not having access to data. Um, and then, you know, as, as a re from purely from a, you know, a pedantic and a research perspective, to me, it's very curious that, you know, as as humans, as learners, we are able to learn quite effectively with imperfect or little data. But then obviously that doesn't seem to be the case for um, contemporary AI or machine learning algorithms. And, and there's a curious question as to why. And this, re this research field is extremely rich. There's so many open problems ranging from weekly, um, semi-weekly self-supervised to transfer learning, zero-shot learning, continual learning, learning from other modalities and generative modeling. So it really is like an all-encompassing field that, that covers many, many open research problems. So, um, so within the context of these, I'm gonna talk about um, various different projects that I have explored specifically in computer vision that, that touch upon um, many different aspects, self-supervised learning, few-shot learning, 
Um, and, and I will talk about how we sort of went about practically um, solving learning with limited labels of data within the context of these problems. So the first problem that I'm going to talk about with, is with regards to um, gaze estimation. And the problem here that we explored was um, in, in trying to, how we can adapt gaze estimation networks in a very few short manner to uh, specific people or individuals. And this was work that we published at ICCV in 2019. Um, so the, the problem here is that typically, you know, gaze networks that, that are CNNs that are trained for gaze estimation, they're often trained on a set of training subjects, but then when you deploy them, they're used by other subjects that's, that's called cross-person gaze estimation. And, um, you know, while the accuracy of such systems has improved quite a bit over the years since CNNs were introduced to like about 4.3 degrees, um, the question is how can we go further? And so um, one of the things that has been discovered is that you, if you take gaze estimation networks and if you um, fine tune them for one particular subject with let's say you know, 2,500 training samples, you can get really good accuracies, which is like gaze errors of down to 2.5 degrees, right? Um, and this is like physically motivated because you know, in the, especially in the case of, you know, networks designed to look at humans or perceive or analyze human behavior, um, there's anatomical differences between subjects and one solution doesn't fit all. So because of like differences in, in the physical factors, you often need to sort of like adapt your, your network to these people, to individuals. So um, now people have now, the question that we want to try to address is like, you know, let's say if you have a system like a gaze estimation system that's deployed in the real world, you obviously don't have the luxury to collect like 2,500 calibration or training samples. You might want to, you might collect like nine or 10 of them, which is typically what people do to like fine tune the system or calibrate the system to a particular subject. Uh, but when people had, had tried to do this, solve this problem using very few samples or in a few shot manner, um, they didn't make much headway as, you know, which is the red graph here versus the blue. So we wanted to try to bridge this huge gap that is between um, few shot adaptation systems for gaze estimation versus those that use a lot of training samples per subject. So we proposed this algorithm called phase. And um, essentially it's, it's designed to um, adapt to each individual to be able to find tune an effort for each individual with very few training examples, which is less than 10. Um, and it had two main components to it. One was to learn a compact representation of a problem, which is particularly for gaze estimation. And the second was that how do you um, basically train a CNN or learn a, a CNN network that is actually amenable to few shot learning? That is, it can be fine tuned without like overfitting to the few samples that you're training with for, the each, for each subject. Um, so, yeah, so I talked about representation learning and meta learning. So first let's look at what the representation learning for the, for the particular task of phase looked like. And um, so in this case, um, what we, for the representation learning piece of it, what we designed was this really interesting architecture, which is uh, inspired by some early work done by Jeff Hinton, which is to use transforming, in, uh, trans, dis, disentangling, transforming encoder decoder architecture or DTAD. The architecture of this um, transforming encoder decoder architecture um, is, is as follows. So the main idea is that you can learn, um, the idea is that you can learn a um, encoder decoder style architecture which is trained with pairs of images of one particular subject, X A, X sub A and X sub B. And the idea is that if you encode X A into a latent space, which is disentangled into various factors related to um, gaze in our, in our particular case, like labeled factors with known gaze and head pose and um, everything else, which is rep represented by this purple, these purple factors, um, the idea is that you can um, then learn this latent space to be three-dimensional and apply a rotation to these um, internal latent factors such that, uh, you know, after you've decoded the transformed latent spaces, you would then be able to um, construct an image which represents, which looks similar to B. 
So basically the idea is that you can transform A to look like B by manipulating the internal latent factors. And you know, whatever uh, transformations that you have, you map them specifically to uh, equivariant rotation values. And uh, by doing so, we disentangled, uh, we learned to disentangle our images into factors related to gaze, to head pose, and um, everything else, which could be anything, environmental factors, blurriness, image quality, et cetera. Um, and with this um, transforming encoder-decoder architecture, uh, we could then take an input patch and um, specifically manipulate its latent factors related to gaze by rotating them up and down or left and right, and then reconstruct images in different gaze orientations. Um, and similarly, we could also reconstruct uh, images with different head orientations. Um, so once we had learned this compact representation, the next piece of it was to basically learn a, um, a CNN for gaze estimation, which is amenable to be being fine-tuned further with very few samples of specific subjects um, without sort of overfitting to just like five or 10 samples that you're training with and be able to like generalize to other examples from that subject. And so, so for that piece of it, we um, basically, what we did was we, uh, through, we, we pass an image through our encoder that we had learned previously and we retain only the representation, the compact representation latent space, which represents gaze. And with that as an input, um, we, tr we train a CNN using MAMO, which is the um, model agnostic meta learning algorithm, which, which basically uh, it, uh, during training, the objective that it satisfies, uh, tries to satisfy is that, that uh, it tries to learn a set of weights during each training iteration such that that network can generalize well to some unknown samples after being trained with um, very few samples of one particular subject. So, so the training objective is slightly different um, in meta learning from a regular sort of training. Um, and you know, when, when you deploy such a system, you have a new subject that comes in, you capture a few calibration samples of those of that subject, and then you like fine tune your system um, with the learned weights that you've learned using NAML. So in terms of the how the kind of results that we got with this was, um, so we, uh, on this MPI gaze data set, which is a standard gaze uh, estimation benchmark data set, um, we found that, um, you know, using just like a, a purely fine tuning based approach leads to overfitting. So on the X axis here, we're showing the number of calibration samples. And especially when you have less calibration samples, you can, you know, quickly lead to overfitting if you use like a simple CNN, uh, which is shown in sign here. Um, the other option is that you could use just a simple neural network and then just simply train that with MAMO. Um, and the third option is what we propose, which is to combine our latent representation uh, with, with MAMO, which is phase ours, which results in the best accuracy. Um, and, you know, we, um, we did various, conducted various ablation studies, and we found that like each of the individual components and losses introduced in our framework, they helped the overall performance. Um, and, you know, these are two da different data sets uh, with comparing against two other uh, state-of-the-art approaches at the time that also try to do few shot learning, the blue and the red, as compared to green, which is ours. We did better than all of them. And um, so just to point out that uh, basically we were able to reduce the errors from about 4.3 degrees, which was the state of the art without calibration to 3.14 um, degrees at nine calibration sample, which is a significant improvement for this problem. And um, just to show you visually what that looks like on a computer screen is like, so if you were asking a subject to view the black point, um, a system, a gaze estimation system that is not calibrated for the particular subject would um, have, would estimate the, the gaze, the, the, or the point of regard lying at the circumference of the red circle. Um, whereas if you had a calibrated system, you would then be within this blue circle. Um, and uh, so this is, um, you know, so that's a huge improvement being able to use such a gaze-based, you know, a webcam based CNN system with uh, ordinary laptops. 
So there's an um, interesting extension we also discovered later after we published this work at ICCV. We followed up with some more recent work, which was published last year at NeurIPS. And um, the, the basic idea was, so what we, what we had discovered in the previous work was that, um, you know, we, we had in our data set, we had two factors that were labeled. So one was gaze and the other was head pose. So for each uh, image, we had these two quantities available during training. However, um, we, we found that like there are other things also, like if you consider a pair of images uh, from a particular subject, it can also happen that, um, you know, there can be other factors that change between those images. So for example, the blurriness might change, the overall lighting might change and so on and so forth. And so we, we wondered whether besides being able to control gaze and head pose, we could also control other factors which we don't have labels for, right? So for example, for lighting or blurriness or um, you know, expressions and things like that, we didn't have any labels for that data. And what we wanted to understand was like, if we could just like, um, just by doing this trick of trying to transform by manipulating the latent codes, trying to transform one image to the other, can we just like discover other latent factors and disentangle them as well? And so we extended our previous work um, to this, um, this work called self-learning, trans extended the DTED architecture to the self-learning transforming encoder-decoder architecture. And um, what we interestingly found was that if you um, sort of, there were two key learnings. So first of all, um, one, one thing that we discovered was that in the previous work, every time we were only predicting the latent code Z um, and, you know, we were transforming it using some gaze value or some head pose value that was being externally applied to the latent variables. However, in this work, we discovered that you can, in addition to predicting the latent um, representation, you can also predict its rotation. Um, or it's like state by the same network. And then, um, you know, and that, that state kind of becomes your label for various different factors. And you can just like sort of, by just doing this process, you can, um, and, and, you know, trying to transform one image to the other, you can discover and disentangle a lot of different factors um, between the images and be able to control them after the fact. So here's, uh, here's an example of, trying to um, do like sort of this transformation between subjects um, or sort of manipulating the latent spaces that was with DTED, which was with the previous work. And you can see like the image quality and so on is not as good and is blurry. And um, this is in comparison, the quality that you can achieve by controlling much more of these internal factors and sort of by discovering them. Um, and we found that like the image quality as well as the range of motion improves significantly by um, trying to discover more factors than just the two that we had labeled. Um, and in, an interesting other um, corollary of this work was that we were able to um, use, um, so sorry, th this is just to show that like this, we, we kind of looked at the quality of um, the images that we were synthesizing in terms of various different uh, metrics. So for example, LPIPS, which is an image quality metric, as metrics like um, in, you know, redirection, meaning like if you say that um, you want to redirect your gaze from a particular input value to a, a particular target value, then you know, how correct or how accurately um, the redirection happens. So redirection fidelity, as well as disentanglement, like if you change um, one internal factor, how much of an effect does it have on the other factor, like gaze to head or head to gaze and so on and so forth. And all these metrics, um, we significantly outperform the previous state of the art. And one interesting corollary of this work was that this work, we were able to even use it for um, semi-supervised learning. So keep in mind that in order to be able to synthesize like images uh, in different gaze and head poses to be able to use that data further for semi-supervised learning, you know, the gaze and head um, redirection has to be quite accurate. Um, so, so, this, so, so this, you know, network turned out to be so this transforming encoder-decoder architecture turned out to be quite useful 
both for the task of learning sort of this disentangled compact representation, um, as well as, uh, you know, for being able to synthesize more images uh, with, with a greater range of motion and, and sort of discovering and disentangling factors. So these are sort of the main, main, uh, main takeaways, which is this, you know, I encourage you to look into this transforming encoder-decoder architecture that we found uh, extremely useful. And then of course, meta-learning, which has been shown to be very useful for many, many different few shot learning problems within the domain of computer vision. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that, you know, how to learn generative models that have, uh, in which, in which we can control things more uh, precisely and accurately. This is obviously still an open question. And, you know, there's a lot been a lot of work, for example, Hologan and StyleGAN um, towards trying to make image generation more controllable. Um, but it still is an open question and there's a lot of research to be done in this area. And, you know, if, if you're students and you're looking for problems, um, you know, this is, this is a wide open field to, to further investigate. Right, and so we have some sort resources as well. We have some, um, you know, open source code, et cetera, that you can also check. Okay, so um, moving on. Next, I'm gonna, you know, move on from few shot learning and semi-supervised learning, where we do have like some amount of labeled data, um, to to talking about some interesting explorations into um, self-supervised learning, and uh, within this context, I'm gonna talk about two applications. Um, the first is on self-supervised learning of, of viewpoint uh, networks from image collections. Um, and this was work we published last year at CVPR. So the task that we're trying to solve here is that we want to train a, a network to be able to predict the viewpoint, which is azimuth, elevation, and tilt of an input uh, object. Um, from a particular category. So for example, in this case, it could be faces. And uh, you know, the, the most straightforward way that people do this, how to train CNNs is, you know, you have supervised data that, um, you know, training data where you know these three values and then, you know, you, you uh, set up a loss and you train your network that way using provided ground truth. However, we, what we want to do is we want to train our network just with images um, without having training data with labels available. And um, so what we want to leverage here is essentially, you know, the ability to just be able to download a bunch of images from the internet of a particular category. So for example, faces, and be able to train a network to estimate the viewpoint of faces, or for example, download images of cars and be able to estimate, train a network to estimate car, such that at inference time, when you present an image, uh, from either of those categories, um, then you know that network can predict um, the viewpoint of the test image. So uh, why do we want to do this? So um, you know annotating viewpoint is obviously a pretty hard problem, and um, you know you know there's various ways that uh, people collect this data. Some sometimes people try to collect synthetic data for um, viewpoint because there you can set up in renderers, you can set up you know, objects in different poses and, and you, you can get accurate viewpoint. Or for example, um, you know, oftentimes uh, in the case of um, real world images that uh, you know, collections that have been got from the internet, people obviously of, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll observe an image, they'll have a gallery of CAD models, they'll find a CAD model that looks like the object presented in the image and find the best match. And then they like kind of move manually move the CAD model around, scale it and rotate it so that it kind of lines up with what you've observed in the image. So obviously this is a very cumbersome and error prone process of labeling viewpoint. Um, the other reason we were interested in this problem was that, um, you know, at the time when we published this last year, there was some work in trying to discover in a self-supervised manner, like without annotations, object parts, um, or like key points or fiducial points. However, there was no work in trying to explore viewpoints. Um, so we proposed this uh, framework called SSV for self-supervised viewpoint estimation. And the key idea that we used to solve this problem was um, to use the idea of analysis by synthesis. So analysis by synthesis is a very classical approach 
um, you know, which has been used for a really long time in computer vision. And uh, what we, we basically did was we sort of um, embedded this in the framework of CNNs. So uh, in particular, we trained a, um, a viewpoint estimation network and a viewpoint aware synthesis network in synergy with each other. We tightly coupled them so that both of them um, give feedback to each other when they're training. And um, that's, that's basically how we um, try to train a network without any labels to do viewpoint estimation. So when we train one of them, the other one's weights are fixed and, um, and, and so on. So let's look at what, how we trained our viewpoint network, viewpoint estimation network. So a viewpoint estimation network is basically um, trained to produce three outputs. One is the viewpoint V, and then in addition, it also produces a style code that sort of represents um, the style of any incoming image. Um, and then um, the third thing that it predicts is whether an incoming image is um, a real or a synthesized image. Um, so, so somewhat like a dis it acts like a discriminator as well. Um, and um, and the like I mentioned while learn, trying to learn the viewpoint, what we leverage is a synth viewpoint aware synthesis network whose weights are fixed. But then um, basically using the sort of uh, values that your viewpoint network about viewpoint and style and so on that it has produced, we use it to synthesize an image using a synthesis network, um, which is then used to provide feedback to train our viewpoint network. So let's look um, in particular, what are the, some of the losses that helped us to train our viewpoint network without actually having these viewpoint labels? So there were three main losses that we designed. Um, one was a generative consistency loss, a symmetry, lo a symmetry constraint, and a discriminator loss. And I'll describe each of these um, briefly. So in the generative consistency loss, they were, it basically comprised of two uh, internal losses. One was an image consistency loss. And the idea here was that, let's say you have an input image that goes into your viewpoint network and it analyzes the image and produces the viewpoint and the style code for it. You can then use that view viewpoint and style code and synthesize an image with the synthesis network whose weights are fixed. And then you compare the input image and the synthesized image in terms of the, the viewpoint here. So you, you wanna make sure that uh, you don't really, in, in our case, we didn't really care about whether the, like the, the person represented or generated in the image was the same, but we did, what we did was we, want, we cared about whether the uh, viewpoint of the object represented in the two images was identical or not. And for this, um, we basically used a set of, uh, a pre-trained image net network. We, uh, you know, there's some studies that show that the image net network, to some extent, preserves rotation equivariance, and so we used features from the internal layers to um, sort of ensure that the the viewpoint was uh, e equivalent in the two images. The um, the other loss that uh, is part of the generative uh, consistency constraint is the style and viewpoint consistency. And here, what we did was we sample a random style and viewpoint, uh, pass it into a synthesis network, synthesize an image, and then um, pass it through our viewpoint network. Um, and the viewpoint network should basically produce whatever we had input or sampled. Um, you should produce the same uh, you know, viewpoint and uh, style code. Um, and then we compare those two. So both of these losses together help to train our viewpoint network to accurately predict the right viewpoint. Um, so the next constraint that we used was a symmetry constraint. And here the idea was that um, if you, you know, this, the, the idea was that like a lot of natural objects have this uh, natural like axis of symmetry, for example, faces or cars, which is like the vertical axis of symmetry. And so why not exploit that constraint? And the idea here is that like, if you predict, if you have the network predict the viewpoint of an image or it's um, flipped version, mirrored version, then um, you expect sort of the uh, azimuth angle to be uh, flipped and the tilt angle to be flipped. So you can basically enforce a consistency between what, is, what the network predicts for an image and its mirrored version in terms of viewpoint. And then um, the last loss that I mentioned was the viewpoint network sort of acts as a discriminator. Um, 
this this um, this is just basically designed to predict whether an image input into it is real or synthetic, and this is this is the this is the part of the viewpoint network which helps to train the synthesis network. Um, you know, since they're trained coupled tightly coupled together and trained in a loop. So let's also look at our synthesis network. So like I mentioned, our synthesis network, um, you know, is not just some ordinary GAN, but is actually a viewpoint aware GAN. Um, and in particular, what it takes in as input is a style code um, to synthesize an image, you know, with a particular appearance as well as a viewpoint. And uh, in our case, what we use, and there's, you know, there's various flavors of these um, recently that have been proposed to, um, you know, for, for viewpoint aware synthesis, but the particular flavor of network that we use was call, is called Hologan, um, wherein the main idea is to manipulate, to learn a um, 3D code, which is manipulated by applying a 3D rotation to the code before, uh, you know, sort of, passing it through the rest of the network to actually generate the image. So it's essentially a GAN, but with a manipulatable uh, 3D code with rotation. So again, again, note here that this, in, this idea of manipulating like sort of your, your generative space with a physical rotation repeats itself. So we saw this idea before when we were talking about the transforming encoder decoder architectures, right? There too, the main idea was to have this three-dimensional latent space that you're, you're actually manipulating with a viewpoint. And, um, but here, this analogous idea is applied to GAN spaces instead. Um, and then in order to train this, again, this um, synthesis, viewpoint-aware synthesis network, um, you know, we basically use our, our viewpoint network whose, uh, you know, the weights are fixed to sort of enforce a bunch of losses, which can be um, used to train our synthesis network. And in particular, we use a GAN loss, a style and viewpoint consistency loss, and a flip image consistency loss. Um, so, so just to look at them really quickly, the um, the GAN loss is pretty much like a discriminator loss that you would use for entraining any you know ad adversarial um, framework, um, and uh, in addition to that, we also came up with this idea of using uh, this paired style and viewpoint consistency. Um, the idea here was that you can input pairs of um, codes. So in one case, um, you can keep the um, you can change the style or and keep the viewpoint constant and use those to um, you know, synthesize an image and then pass them through your viewpoint network. And the viewpoint network should then um, you know, reproduce the same viewpoint, but uh, different style codes. And similarly, you can um, change the uh, viewpoint and keep the style constant and create another pair with which you can learn. Um, and uh, similar to what you saw before with the uh, symmetry, similar to the symmetry constraint, we also use a flip image consistency constraint for objects that have this natural, um, you know, axis of symmetry to um, basically enforce further constraints by learning a synthesis network. So in terms of the results, uh, these are some examples of being able to synthesize uh, you know, more objects beyond like faces, like for example, cars, et cetera, with different uh, azimuth angles, elevation angles, um, as well as tilt angles. And, uh, and so uh, in terms of the actual viewpoint accuracy, the first experiment that we did was to look at head poles and uh, we compared it against, we compared our method against various other state-of-the-art self-supervised techniques for viewpoint estimation and we found that we performed significantly better than all the existing methods with an average error of 6.7 degrees. Um, and also when we compared against fully supervised approaches uh, for head pose estimation, we found that we were in fact uh, very competitive with many of the supervised techniques as well. And we outperformed um, many of the top supervised techniques as well. So this is really exciting, the fact that you know you um, using sort of this analysis by synthesis loop and learned synthesis in the middle um, with, with our analysis networks, we can indeed, you know, learn to um, learn networks without requiring labels, which is really exciting. So we also looked at other objects besides faces. We looked at cars and buses and trains. Um, there too, we found that um, we were very competitive 
with uh, some of the supervised techniques as well. And in, in fact, for trains, we even surpassed the supervised techniques, which was interesting. So yeah, this is just um, showing some more quantitative, qualitative results. So just to you know, kind of recap and summarize the main takeaways. So the main takeaways in this work was that, um, you know, in general, it was, it was really interesting to discover that we can indeed do this task in a fully supervised manner with just using images from the internet and by using this sort of joint analysis and synthesis framework. Um, however, here too, I, like I mentioned, we use this controllable GANs in, in particular, the HoloGAN. And, um, you know, if you wanted to extend these sort of techniques to other attributes and, um, you know, things besides viewpoint, um, the open question remains is like, how can we design GANs that, that can indeed control for other factors um, besides like viewpoint? We, we, viewpoint was something we controlled by manipulating that 3D GAN code. Um, but what about other things? And, you know, this is again, a wide open field um, to try to improve and do re more research in. And again, these are some resources that I can, um, you can check out to learn more. All right, so moving on. Um, so the next uh, series, the next work that we also explored was on self-supervised um, single view 3D reconstruction uh, via semantic consistency. So here, the task that um, you know, we were trying to do was, let's say you're given a collection of images of a specific category. We want to, um, you know, we want to be able to reconstruct a 3D mesh from a single image, presented image of, that, of an object. And uh, we wanted to be able to do this without using any sort of category level 3D um, semantic template. Um, and uh, also we wanted to be able to, um, you know, not use any kind of annotations on our image, for example, semantic key points, et cetera. So it is self-supervised in these two respects. That is, it doesn't use any, um, you know, shape template for the category, and it doesn't use any annotations like key points, et cetera, from the image. Um, so, so this is the main task that I mentioned, that is to reconstruct from these input images, the complete 3D model of this object. So, um, so the, the, the key idea that, um, you know, most works, the, the key idea that we, you know, sort of used was, if you have different instances of a particular category, so for example, let's say you have birds, right? Um, the, the mesh itself, for different instances of a particular category, the mesh, um, you know, the, the, the topology or what the various points on the mesh represent, right, in terms of the semantic parts, that remains the same. And the corresponding to the mesh is um, sort of, you know, there's this UV layout of the mesh, which uh, sort of represents the various semantic parts. So that remains essentially the same when you go from one instance to the other, but what basically changes from one instance to the other is the way that that mesh is deformed, right? Like the, the shape of that mesh. So that is the key idea that uh, we kind of used in this work that basically, you know, different instances, whatever their shape might be, there is this common UV space for all of them that you can, you can exploit. And if you can segment out that um, common UV space and find like common parts, subparts within it, you can then, you know, basically um, be able to, to uh, essentially find these, uh, these uh, semantic parts for each of each instance of your, uh, from your category. So that's the key idea that we exploited. And uh, we built upon previous work. This is Amju Kanazawa's uh, work called CMR. And uh, this, was, this was a quite a fundamental work in trying to do single view reconstruction. And the main idea in this work is that, you know, you have given an input image, you uh, train an encoder decoder architecture, which essentially maps the provided input image to a texture map, a UV texture map. Uh, and starting from a template, it produces deformations of the shape template to uh, create a 3D shape which matches the presented image, and also it predicts the camera viewpoint. And then using a differentiable renderer, 
um, which in their case, maybe for example, a soft rasterizer, you then render um, the image um, using all these properties, which is the camera pose, the 3D shape, as well as the texture. And then you enforce losses between the rendered image as well as the input image. And in particular, the losses that are used are usually um, the silhouette loss, which is to enforce that the mask or the silhouette looks similar of the rendered image looks similar to the input, um, as well as like an image consistency or a likeness loss that you can enforce. So in addition, um, so in Anju's work, uh, the, this previous CMR work, the assumptions are that, um, you know, they assume that you're given the camera viewpoint um, as well as, or, or you can compute the camera viewpoint using semantic key points, or you're given the camera viewpoint. And the other assumption is that you have a category level shape template. So you would start with like an average bird shape for the category of birds. So what we found that if you uh, take CMR, and if you remove this, um, the availability of this camera, or in, in their case, which comes from the semantic availability of semantic key points, um, the results get worse. And uh, if you further remove the prior template, the bird template, they get even um, worse. So in, so, but in our case, even without these two things, we are able to reconstruct and get good reconstructions um, despite you know, sort of using the self-supervised approach. So what we did was, the first thing we did was, since we are not using the semantic key points, we, need to, we needed to have um, you know, some way of establishing correspondence between the subparts of different instances of words. Um, and this, what we did was we exploited some previous work called SCOPS, which is on self-supervised co-part segmentation. And the main idea of this particular SCOPS work is to, um, to basically be able to discover in a self-supervised manner by applying uh, non-negative matrix factorization on, um, on like pre-trained ImageNet features, it, it tries to discover in a self-supervised manner specific semantic co-parts of, uh, of a particular category. So, so this, is, this is one main idea that instead of using semantic key points, we use this, these discovered semantic uh, co-parts that are discovered in a self-supervised manner. So the next thing that we did was now that we have these uh, you know, consistent semantic parts across different instances of a category, we kind of use the, we, we use two main things um, to further learn a shape template and as well as you know, consistent parts on that 3D shape template. So the one thing we do is that we using these um, in the co-parts uh, segments, we forward propagate them through the previous network that I showed, uh, the CMR network, uh, using learned flow onto the UV map. And uh, what we expect is that the UV map you learned from various different instances should basically be identical. So we average across all of them to learn a category specific part segmentation UV map. And another thing we discovered was that um, you can indeed start with a spherical template and uh, over the course of training after several epochs, um, you know, by averaging the sort of the shapes that you've learned from um, the 3D shape that you've learned from each of your instances, you can slowly attempt 3D template slowly starts to emerge for the particular category. So these were the two main discoveries in this particular work. Um, and all of this is basically done using this end-to-end -end differentiable rendering pipeline. Um, and uh, so I, I will skip over too many um, details of this work, but, but basically, you know, as I mentioned, we're able to learn both these uh, seg segments on the 3D template as well as the shape of the template. Um, and uh, so I will skip over most of these, but just to show you some results with this particular work, um, you know, we were successfully able to learn birds of different shapes, even some birds with open wings, which is pretty neat and exciting without, you know, having any sort of annotations for key points or, or sort of a, a shape template for the category. Um, so here's some more examples with cars, as well as with motorcycles with rigid objects. And here too, um, you know, we were able to learn, um, you know, consistent shapes. 
And here's some more examples with animals. And here you can see that, uh, you know, since we deform from a spear, this is a very common problem that uh, happens specifically when we're trying to sort of, um, you know, deform from a sphere to highly non-convex objects. You can see like the legs sort of join together. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a common limitation of works that sort of consider one contiguous UV texture instead of considering like an atlas of um, various different UV, UV textures. Okay, so um, just to sort of summarize, what I want to distill from this is there is this one key idea that you know was fundamental to sort of solving this problem, which was to sort of establish correspondence between uh, the different subparts of um, the various instances from a particular category. And the key idea that we used to establish this correspondence was of finding these uh, co-parts or segments on you know, a self-supervised manner. And um, there is another related idea that uh, has generally been found that we have found to be quite useful for self-supervised learning is also of trying to establish correspondence between different viewpoints of a particular instance. So for example, in video frames, for example, it's often the case that you have one particular instance, but then you keep seeing different viewpoints or different deformations if it, if it is a deformable object indeed. And this is also a very powerful idea that can be exploited to um, sort of learn in computer vision in a self-supervised manner. Um, and this is, this, this is something that we exploited in a, in a work that we published in Europe. And the key idea here was to, to learn affinities between like corres corresponding frames or, or neighboring frames in a video where let's say if you have n pixels in one frame and you have another n pixels in the other frame, you, learn, you sort of learn this like, uh, learn affinity matrix between dense pixel wise correspondence between the two frames. And uh, one of the ideas that we have exploited to learn this affinity in a, in a self-supervised manner is this idea of colorization. And the key idea here is that like if you, consider the um, a, a region of one frame, a black and white frame, and you consider its color, and you try to um, basically use this to reconstruct the color of a neighboring frame or to sort of propagate the color and reconstruct in another uh, you know, neighboring frame in the video, you can then use this idea of being able to correctly color things from one frame to the other to learn the right correspondence between frames. And we've previously shown that you can use this successfully to, for example, um, learn to do object, dete uh, object detection across a video or semantic segmentation across a video in a self-supervised manner to, by learning this dense correspondence. Um, and one other idea, you know, within this, um, this similar idea of um, trying to maintain temporal correspondence um, this, this idea, we also extended it uh, in the context of shape reconstruction. And uh, here, the idea was that uh, we used it, we used this idea that there is like, you know, there's, there's some consistency that you can maintain for a particular instance or a particular object across video frames um, to do something called test time training. And here, the idea was we, you know, we were in our, in our previous work, we were reconstructing the, um, the 3D meshes frame by frame. But let's say that, you know, if you at, at test time, you encounter a video, you can further enforce constraints related to the fact that, you know, the, the 3D shape, if it is indeed a rigid object should, or a neighboring frame should uh, remain somewhat uh, consistent across frames. You can also impose the constraint that the UV texture of whatever you're predicting should somewhat remain const constant across frames. Um, and then also that, uh, you know, the various part segments should also sort of remain consistent across frames. So you can further exploit this to refine the 3D model that you, you have learned and, um, you know, do some test time training um, during inference time. And uh, what we found that was that this um, sort of idea also is quite powerful. And so you can see at the in the, um, in the top row, we show results of trying to do this reconstruction of this video frame by frame 
And in the bottom are the results for when we try to do it um, you know, with our test time training framework where we exploit this consistency in the temporal do domain across frames um, and enforce various forms of consistency. So we get much more stably, temporally stable reconstructions. And uh, here is another example, which is for a zebra. And here too, in the top row, are the reconstructions done frame by frame. In the bottom, you, know, you can sort of exploit this temporal consistency and get better reconstructions. Um, so yeah, so the key takeaways are that you know, um, both these, um, you know, trying to do this reconstruction and viewpoint together, it's a little post problem, but um, you know, you can, you can um, try to um, you know, enforce some part-based consistency, which can be learned in a, in a self-supervised manner. And by leveraging this correspondence across either across instances or across various viewpoints of a particular instance, um, they can help to remove some of these ambiguities in shape and viewpoint and do better reconstructions. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, uh, we have the code available for this as well. And uh, you can check out our website. Um, so I just um, you know, want to end my talk and maybe leave some time for questions. So I think I just want to men, you know, share some high level thoughts of um, you know, what I think are some open areas and you know, some encourage you all to conduct research in some of these um, interesting areas. So I think self-supervised learning you know, for the past year or so, I've, I've seen that emerge as um, a very interesting and open area. A lot of, a lot of work is uh, happening. And I think a lot of it is fueled by the fact that now we sort of have this um, you know, synthesis. We have a lot of ways of synthesizing in a differentiable manner whether that be encoders or uh, de encoder decoder architectures or GANs um, or uh, differentiable um, rendering pipelines that have also emerged recently. So, so all of these, you know, this is a important uh, powerful tools that can be leveraged. And, um, but I think the key thing in self-supervised learning is that what I have realized is that um, it's, uh, it's important to sort of, you have to design losses um, that can that can help you in in learning in a self supervised manner, and oftentimes um, these losses have to be designed carefully. Otherwise, they can lead to um, some you know they can lead to collapse during training, or they can lead to degenerate solutions. So um, so this this piece remains quite key in in learning in a self supervised manner. It's like how do you break the degeneracies while they're sort of trying to learn in in, in self supervised manner. The other I think interesting area is also trying to learn. I think is not very widely explored is trying to learn from imperfect labels. So for example, if you have um, noisy labels or weaker labels, you know whether that may be captions. Um, or uh, or some some sort of not not uh, you know some, some uh, for example for semantic segmentation you might have labels regarding like the presence of an image of an object in the image but you don't know where it is present and so on so so trying to learn from sort of imperfect or weak labels is is also quite interesting and uh, you know there's there's also this other emerging trend um, which is quite interesting which is of sort of uh, uh, of deep inversion, this idea that you know you can take, for example, uh, networks, discriminative networks, um, and be able to invert them and uh, sort of figure out what the input images or image content might be. So um, all of these, I think, are very interesting and open directions in in sort of trying to reduce both the labels as well as um, the data required for training. And um, there's also this last area, which is you know trying to look at biologically inspired learning, um, which is which I think has some potential in trying to learn with less labels. Uh, but obviously, this is um, you know this this a this is a very 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 little explored area of um, how how sort of our human brain has the ability to do both generative as well as discriminative learning, and. Uh, that I think can also be something that can inform our ability to learn with less labels and data. 
Um, I think uh, that is all. And with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Shalini. It was great talk, a lot of exciting works. I especially Thank like you. the future direction that you mentioned about the limitation of self-supervised learning and the future direction in this area. So uh, feel free to ask questions. If there are any questions, feel free to ask. I personally have uh, uh, questions about slide number 15. If you have it. Okay. Yeah, my yes. question is how you, uh, uh, did you add some constraint to make sure this disentanglement of the features? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, yes, we did have a constraint, which is, uh, we call this embedding consistency. And uh, the constraint here, the what the constraint here said was that um, what we did was for every subject, um, when we encode their image to let's say gaze and head pose, you what you can do is, you, since you know the gaze of this input image, you can apply the inverse of that gaze value and that should represent like frontal gaze, right? Zero degrees gaze. Um, so what we do is we basically, apply the inverse of G to this latent code for every, every subject, for uh, all images of a subject, mm -hmm. and frontalize this gaze code. Similarly, we frontalize the head pose code. And then what we enforce is that in the embedding consistency loss is that the frontalized versions of the gaze code and the head pose code for all images of a particular subject should be very similar to each other. So there shouldn't be much difference between uh, what the, the frontalized embedding is, is encoded to for different uh, images of a subject. And what the effect of this was, it, tries to, it, it tends to push out factors that are not related to gaze and head pose out of these codes and into this pink code mm -hmm. um, by making them, by enforcing this consistency. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Uh, did you also try perceptual loss to improve the quality of the synthetic images? Uh, in this one, we did not, but you're right. Actually, in the in the following work, we did. In the SD TED, this work that I mentioned, uh, in this one, we had a perceptual loss. And in particular, um, we had the uh, LPIPS loss, yes. Um, and we also had a GAN loss as well in this, it, and it was a, specifically a patch GAN-based loss. Yes, yes. That's true. So my last comment about uh, your test on adaptation, I was wondering if uh, this temporal correspondence can be used for visual tracking because we, in visual tracking, we have mm -hmm. a similar scenario. We have this kind of template matching with respect to the uh, original uh, position of the object in the first frame. Uh, do you think it can be used for visual tracking um, yes, so definitely. So in this uh, particular work that I showed uh, where we were trying to sort of use this idea of colorization um, to learn the dense correspondence between frames, right? Um, this, the downstream task that we did perform after we learned these affinities. So the idea is that you learn the affinity by trying to color, but then the affinities that we learn, we use them to learn to do actually do visual tracking on top of it, both for tracking bounding boxes as well as for tracking segmentations across video frames. So indeed, you know, this idea of trying to establish correspondence is very powerful and useful. Because one of the projects uh, we're going to initiate soon is multi-target tracking. I was thinking if you have multiple targets, uh, maybe it's more challenging to have single targets. Yes, that's true. Um, actually, we have a very recent work um, which has just been accepted to CVPR, that we uh, which which addresses exactly this multi-target tracking in a self-supervised manner. Um, I didn't present that work, but I would be happy to send you. Um, sure, you sure, know, please. Yeah, yeah, that but that does exactly that. That you know, um, and so what we found there was an additional loss we added to um, in that multi-target tracking work which was we added a cycle loss as well. So the idea was you, need, you, you should be, if you start out from frame 
uh, number zero and skip to, you know, you, you establish a correspondence between one frame and the next one, and then you go to another one, and then you, sh you should be able to, you know, so you get these like multiple affinity matrices. If you multiply all those affinity matrices, you should be able to get back and reconstruct the original just frame the process. Yes. Yeah. So in this work, we were just going from frame A to frame B and trying to just like reconstruct A to B, right? So in that we added a cycle loss, which also helped quite a bit. Um, and also we had sort of to address this, um, um, this problem of, uh, uh, as you said, multiple, you know, multi-target. Uh, we also added some contrastive learning um, within that framework to sort of, you know, isolate in different instances and identify them. So I, I will send you a link to that as well. That Thanks work so is, it builds on this. That should be very interesting. So please ask questions if there are any. <clears throat> hi, hi, uh, Shalini. Thanks for your interesting talk. I had one question. I mean. I mean, you presented different works, and I think what is the role of geometry? I mean, mm -hmm. do you absolutely need geometry? I think it's mainly used for viewpoints and these kind of projections, mm -hmm. maybe, and mm -hmm. representations. But beyond that, I mean, do you use? I mean, I mean, do you think that's absolutely necessary, or what's your viewpoint about that? Thanks. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, Jean Marc. Nice to meet. Uh, nice to meet you again. Um, by geometry, just to clarify, do you mean uh, like the, the full three D reconstruction? Is that what your is the question? I mean, like having really like, you know, like a pose representation, you know, with absolute values, case values, which corresponds to, you know, 3D elements and stuff like this, right? All these, all these, these aspects of, of geometry here. It's uh, whether it's only appearance based and I mean, it's embeddings that represent somehow the information, but that might not correspond to the matrix we we use right i mean to represent a pose or a viewpoint or whatever right oh i see i see so uh so are you referring to the fact that um the the sort of the viewpoint that we are inputting into a gan or or whatever encoding network to control the viewpoint may not actually represent uh, what it should be is that what you're sort of saying is that the question yeah, exactly. That that's my point. Yeah, how much? Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you think you you can build on geometrical models? For instance, if you think about bodies, would you like you know to have a biomechanical model of the body, or do you think it you have something that allows to synthesize emotions of elements of, of the you know the yeah the locomotions of people, but it may not represent you know like a physical model or, or the way we would represent it. So. Or is it also due to the renderer? The renderer needs both elements, so mm. for instance, you, you you need those anyway. So that's that's the motivation. Yeah. But potentially, you you may skip them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see your point. So I think yeah, I completely understand your question now. So I think that like if our synthesis, so there's an analysis piece which is going to be our network, right? And then there is a synthesis piece. I think if our synthesis piece is something like a differentiable renderer right? Um, the representations that it uses are, are certainly like more biomechanical or more like geometric, right? So they, it uses specifically uh, pose or, or, you know, biomechanical motion and so on and so forth, because most of the primitives used in computer graphics are like that, right? So I think that, um, you know, if, if you're using a differentiable rendering kind of pipeline, then I, I do think that you sort of want to be analyzing properties which are closer to what real geometries would look like, right? However, if you use something like a neural renderer, um, there, I don't necessarily think that um, you need to analyze specifically or precisely uh, exactly the geometric properties. You could possibly analyze to some latent space which doesn't represent directly the properties um, but but here's the question though I ask is if you if you analyze to some latent space which is esoteric and not directly um, related to the geometric properties, they do need to be somehow controllable though, right? Um, and uh, like in the sense that those latent properties need to be somewhat equivariant with specific changes that we want in 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 the real world like geometry, etc. Yeah. So. Yeah. Then, then we need to have that mapping. And then the question becomes like, how do we find that mapping? Is it then easier to just get 
physical properties you know what i mean um so yeah so that's that those are my two cents i don't know if i fully answer your question no no i fully understand i mean it's just that when we do like these unsupervised elements i mean some somehow we we synthesize images and things are based on images and so at some points maybe the representation may represent what we want but not in the way we want but i fully understand yeah. that for exploitations and analysis and wh wherever we want this information it's useful at this point to map this to the representation we know to that we need to manipulate so yeah I correct agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it has to be manu manu manipulatable. That is the key idea, and and controllable somehow. Yeah. And otherwise, this whole yeah. yeah, exactly yeah. interpretable. Exactly. Yeah, and otherwise, this analysis by synthesis doesn't work, right? Uh, it's just harder to work because you can just yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks again, Shalini, for the great talk. And can you hear me? By the way. Yes, I can hear you. So it was a great talk and I appreciate, I know it's too late there for accepting my invitation again. And my pleasure. Thanks again, please keep in touch. And I'm just waiting for the link that you're gonna share with me and we probably can collaborate on some topics in the future. So Excellent. thanks everyone for joining this talk. See you soon in two weeks and have a great day. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for attending and uh, thank you for the invitation, Vezan. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.